Hey, hey there. Are we on? He, we are. We are right. live in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Tech Talks, everybody. We took a bit of a hiatus for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Lots of stuff but, going on. Yeah. Lots of stuff. <laughs> lots of good things. Yeah. So. What you been up to, Jason? I've been up to a lot. Um, uh, you know, got a couple of really exciting things, uh, training related in the works right now. We've got a couple of some videos, content that's in the works. That's going to be really exciting that I'm excited about. Um, nice. These, you know, preparing for another round of these tech talks. It's been, it's been good. You know? Yeah. How about you? What are you up to? <laughs> well, <laughs> now that we're I, today, I heard we are in the red tier with our, um, COVID related stuff. So there's some indoor dining that's hey. happening. Yeah, which is cool. Now, Campus that's Jacks, exciting. we've been full blown back outside doing live concerts. So that's been that's been fun. But now we're yeah. going to add music inside and outside. So I'm going to be right. running around. <laughs> that's cool. It's going to be crazy. Moving in the right direction. I like that. Yes, we are. It's awesome. awesome. Well, speaking of live music, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna talk. Our topic today uh, has very much to do with live music production. Yeah, and real quick, I'll welcome everyone. Welcome to QSC Tech Talk. I'm Golden Preciado, audio engineer and house of worship specialist with QSC, along with Jason Fernandez, live sound training specialist with QSC. Yeah, like Jason said, today we are talking about some techniques and tips on how to get a sweet, stellar sounding vocal sound That's using it. our touch mix mixer. Vocal channels. Yep. It is going to be eye opening. If you're, if you feel like you're listening to muddy vocals, this is going to be super helpful and clear up some stuff for you. Yeah. And, I mean, and if you're just kind of starting out um, and you, don't really know where to go or where to start uh, with your vocal channel. Uh, we're, we're hopefully going to give you some tips and tricks that you can use and get yourself started. So it should be, it should be fun. I'm excited to talk about this. Yeah. Um, awesome. Should we, should we get going? Should I just kick it off? Yeah, Go for it, Jason. All right. So um, it. I'm going to switch over and, and I'm going to show you some things on my actual touch mix in a minute, but just to, to start us off, um, we're going to be talking about three primary things uh, related to or three primary tools uh, that we're going to use on our vocal channel to kind of clean it up, uh, take out the muddiness, um, add some intelligibility, um, make it sit well, make it fit really well, and have presence within a mix, uh, as well as uh, sweeten it up. We're gonna we're gonna really kind of jazz it up a little bit and make it sound awesome. And those things are EQ. First, so we're gonna go over some EQ settings or some starting points, if nothing else, uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about compression. Um, so EQ and compression are are pretty standard tools that are used um, on many channels within a mix, but certainly a vocal channel. Uh, and then the third element is to sweeten it up. We're going to add some effects. And so we'll talk about adding the effects, um, you know, which effects uh, work well with vocals um, and maybe in blending effects to certain degrees and things like that. So uh, this should be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. And real quick, um, Jim, I see your comment here on vocal mix and difference between sub and using no sub or ah. sub and jason is going to jump into that on the eq section of Definitely. our our vocal talk so let's this do one's it. for you Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah take it All away right. for us jason here we are so here's my touch mix 30. i'm gonna uh, use this as my demonstration for today um so as i said the first thing we're gonna go over is eq so i'm gonna go ahead and just open a channel i've got a microphone plugged into channel one here you can already see that the meter is dancing i've got a as uh, you can see this in the upper corner there. I've just got a, a you know, SM58 plugged in here. Uh, and we'll use this as our example. So I'm going to go to the EQ tab of my mixer. And this is the EQ. This is a four band parametric EQ uh, with high and low pass filters. So the first thing that I'm going to recommend uh, for, for anybody out there, it, it, whether you are a professional or, or this is the first time doing this, or you're just looking for, for some help or guidance along the way, if you do nothing else to your vocal EQ, engage your low cut. Also might be called a high pass. It depends on the, the mixer you're using or the software you're using. A low cut and a high pass filter are the same thing. And it's just two different ways of labeling that, I suppose. Um, we're going to go ahead and just turn that on. I'm going to do that by engaging that button. And then you can and see you guys right here just on the graph. Yes. 
just I just want to let everybody know everything that Jason is teaching today is applicable on whatever mixer you step exactly. up. Exactly. Yeah. We're showing you on a touch mix, but this is stuff you will want to know for any mixer you this is step up to. General audio knowledge. Yeah. So any yep. mixer you're using, even if you're working within a, a digital audio workstation, a software, you know, all of these yep. tools are going to be in there and all of these concepts apply. Exactly. Um, so here you go. Here's step one. Turn on your low cut filter. And Jim, this kind of addresses your question. Um, you don't, you, you, when you're talking about a vocalist, you want to kind of remove a lot of the low, low end from that channel, first of all. And you, additionally, you don't want your vocal channel to be going to your subwoofer if you have control over that. Um, Correct. Vocals have no place in a subwoofer. Um, so here we go. We're going to eliminate that. And what that does is that takes away all of the, the, the low frequencies that a aren't even there because a, a vocal range typically doesn't go down, you know, that low. Um, and it's going to eliminate some of the muddiness and it's going to add just by doing that, you're actually going to add some intelligibility to the channel by cutting all of that low stuff out. Right. Now, um, the default setting, you can see here, I want to turn that on. It gave me the curve right here and that is set to 120 Hertz. That is the frequency that that filter is uh, defaulted to. Um, and you could probably leave that there for most, for the most part. But if you did want to kind of fine tune it a little bit, you can simply select that and then use your dial here to adjust that filter. So I can go up the frequency scale or down. Um, so if I wanted to scoot it up, if, if the, my vocalist um, has, has a high, a bit of a higher range and I wanted to get that filter a little closer to where their, the actual bottom range of their voice is, I could kind of nudge it up and get a little closer. On the inverse, you know, if, if they've got a particularly uh, bassy voice and you want more of that low, low resonance um, to reside in there, you can. That happens to me bit. with my vocal groups and my vocal groups where I actually have a bass singer, I will need to add back some of that lower frequency range. See? Yep, there you go. Makes makes perfect. The sense. interesting thing to note is when we use our low cut, we're not saying it's cutting off right at 120. It's actually sure. rolling off it's gradually rolling, at yeah. 120. And, and, so we're still capturing some of those um lower frequencies it's just it's rolling off gradually yeah. gradually yeah that's a good point um so there you go oh, i'll go ahead and leave this at 120 or 125 it wants to be right now so that's fine um and there you go that you could be done that that will get you a channel that is usable if nothing else now if you did want to to go further in your eq there are certain things that you might want to pay attention to um a couple of other areas to note that you might want to start make some cuts in. So when you're talking about an EQ, there are there is using filters to cut frequencies and boost frequencies. So we're gonna talk about a few areas that you um, traditionally would cut in a vocal channel first. Um, the first thing after your low cut is between, the, between about 150 and 400 Hertz uh, is where you're gonna get a lot of uh, what's commonly referred to as boxiness. Uh, in in the sound, and this this actually applies to a lot of different channels. That just just about any channel um, yeah. you might have some some just unwanted uh, muddy boxiness right in that range. Um, and, and a vocalist is no different. So in my experience, it tends to be closer to four hundred is where you're going to find this sound. Um, and just as a reference, um, if you can imagine the sound of like a, a basketball or a like one of those red dodgeballs hitting the, uh, the blacktop, kind of that airy kind of bouncy sound that gets that that's sort of what I'm talking about. That just, and it's, it's very unpleasing. Um, and so that is an area that we usually try to eliminate. And mm -hmm. I'm going to do that by setting my first filter here uh, at 400 hertz and I'll select the gain dial and I'll just start to pull that down a few dB. And I can even adjust the bandwidth of that so I can focus it more around that 400 if I want to, or I can widen it if I want it to kind of capture a, a, a more of a, a wider breadth of frequencies around 400. So um, it's and, interesting and to interesting to note that um, the proximity to your mic will have a lot to do with how boxy it sounds. The closer in proximity you are to the mic, the, point, yes. the warmer it is. And when you're talking about a full band surrounding a vocal, you may need to cut more of these frequencies between 200 and 400 to make mm -hmm. the vocal more intelligible. Mm -hmm. that, now, I I am all for close mic proximity because it, <laughs> it yeah. lets the engineer mix and yep. then it takes away ambient noise that's getting in the mic because the, the engineer is now allowed to have control of the vocal. So I encourage my vocalists as much as possible to get on their mics. Yes. 
get get up on them. Yeah. So, and also you know, as another tip to this whole uh, topic, um, as the mix engineer, don't be afraid to uh, to give a little mic holding uh, lesson lesson <laughs> to your vocalists. Uh, you'd be surprised yes. how many vocals out there don't really know proper mic technique or how to hold a mic properly. Um, so, yeah, certain things you want to avoid, like. Well, you know, once upon a time, we didn't have all that. Um, we didn't have like all the compression built into the mixer. Sure. And all that stuff. Our mixers were very simple, so they were taught to mix themselves by pulling the mic away and doing all the stuff. Fair, that's fair. In this case, we have tools. Yeah. So like, don't that, worry about it. Same thing doesn't you, apply. <laughs> you, you keep that thing right here, and I got the rest. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Exactly. Um, cool. So the kind of moving on here, we took it, we were taking out some boxiness in that, uh, 150 to 400 range. Um, another area, um, where you might start to get some nasal quality that can be again, unpleasing. Um, you might start to find that uh, between 800 and about 1.5 K, um, anywhere in there, you might want to make a, a, a slight cut if you're, if you're getting that quality out of your vocalist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if then your vocalist um, likes to grip his mic, the um, yeah, like like uh, this all part of the mic. Yeah. This is the frequency yeah. that is accentuated. So That's for right. somebody who's holding the ball of their mic and getting that nasally tone like that, you'll definitely want to cut you, that. You want to have a talk with them, yeah, <laughs> and also just cut this out. Um, uh, and then up up in the very high range, kind of up in here in the very high register. Uh, between uh, maybe 7K all the way up to about 12K, that's where you're going to get what's commonly referred to as air or, or, or that kind of the really high end, the really brightness uh, area of, of a vocal range or of that channel. And depending on what you're going for, you may want to either cut or boost in that region. Um, for the most part, um, I, I'll, I'll usually give some cuts in there. I could even also engage my shelf here and set that to about 7 or 8K and just drop that down a little bit. So again, I'm kind of rolling off kind of all those highs up, up at that point. Um, and then um, as a, as a area to focus in, which may require some boosting uh, would be between two and four K. So right here. So my filter, my filter number three here is defaulted to two K. So I could grab that and I could push that up a little bit and maybe kind of just uh, range around a little bit between two and four K and kind of find the presence of that vocalist and, and give that a little boost. Um, and that, that's just, so at that point, what we're doing is we're eliminating, um, kind of offending frequencies and, and areas that either aren't needed or, or, or just are unpleasing. And, and then we're kind of going to give a little boost and we're going to bring out more of the, the good qualities and the presence of the vocals. And again, this can go with anything. Um, right. Good thing to, to note though is that while we are making a boost in this region it's good to keep that in mind because you may also want to make cuts in that same region on other instruments you know so not only are we are we using our eq to focus and uh, carve the sound of our vocal channel we're going to use the same thing on other channels for the same purpose I, as we mentioned at the top we want to add intelligibility to a vocal channel and we can do that not only by by applying the eq on the vocal channel itself but also using the EQ on other channels to make cuts in the regions that maybe are clashing with the vocal channel to make more room for the intelligibility of that channel to kind of shine. Exactly. Through. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, no. And with that, I know this is, this is, we're talking about this very quickly. Um, there are really cool things you can find on the internet. And Brad, why don't you uh, show that EQ graph at this point? So there you go. So there's an, an example of a graph that kind of shows you the frequency range and then um, highlights the different points at which you might want to be adjusting for certain things to either get rid of certain things or or boost certain things. And a simple uh, web search for you know vocal EQ chart or EQ chart, uh, you'll you'll find stuff like this all over the place. But we thought this was a pretty good one. Um, yeah. Want to take a look at that for a second? You can see kind of the things I was talking about. You know, you got your low cut right there, right off the bat. Um, you've got your you know, you're, it's talking about removing boominess and small room resonance in the one to 150 range. Um, you've got your in, it, talking about increasing clarity uh, between 180 and 240. Um, again, up on the higher rate region, we've got um, you know the presence uh, between three and six K. And I I recommended two and four, so you might get varying um, 
recommendations, uh, but it's all kind of within the same regions usually. Um, so there you go. Yeah, I yeah. would highly recommend what you, whatever stage uh, at audio engineering you're at, get a hold of something like this and have that handy because it can really kind of help you. Get your mixer point. right in front of you. Yeah, yeah, nothing wrong <laughs> with it either. I still use stuff like this. Yeah. And I have one little method that I like to use if I can't quite find something that's just sounding awful. It's a method I use um, called the um, boost sweep and cut method. Yes. And it helps me to helpful. identify something that just sounds awful. If you might grab your um, low mid frequency there, mm -hmm. tighten up the cue, and, and we'll show them what that is. Yeah. So... Uh, again, I'm tightening up the cue, so so I, I want to make the cue as almost as narrow as I can, and then we're gonna boost this somewhere boost in the region like, like 10 dB or more. So uh, you can, yeah. And, so you can and really then we're hear the to to do a sweep here. So and this is as we're sweeping this up and down, we're going to be able to very easily identify uh, where that uh, where, awful. yeah <laughs> where uh, and Eric and the, this is um. And right now we're boosting it, but we're using this as a tool to like a magnifying glass to, to really yes. find where those problem areas is. And then once we find it, we use that same filter to, to cut it out. Yes. Gain. So then we'll, we'll just go and drag that down. And, and then you'll you very quickly want to hear a, a difference in that. Once you find yeah. that frequency and then you pull that filter down, you, you eliminate that harshness or that boominess or that raspiness, whatever it may be. Um, it just, it becomes much more pleasing. So that is an excellent method. Yeah, thank you for it's that, Golden. Boost, sweep, and cut. <laughs> boost, sweep, and cut. There you go. Sounds like something from Karate Kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, cool. So that takes care of EQ uh, for the most part. So after EQ, we would come over to the compressor and apply some compression. And just really quickly, a compressor is a tool that is used to compress or condense the dynamic range of a signal. So um, if you think of a, a dynamic audio signal that's can, that can get loud and can get quiet, it's going a compressor is going to take the loudest points and the lowest points and squish them so they're a, a little bit closer together um, so that you can have a little bit more control over the dynamics within a mix. It just makes things fit uh, a lot better within a mix with other instruments and gives you, as the engineer, a lot more control over the overall dynamics. Um, and so on a vocal channel, this is really important because if you think of a vocalist, uh, or, or a voice, a voice has the ability to get very, very quiet or very, very loud, very can, large dynamic range, very yeah. large dynamic range. And, you know, if you're sitting here, uh, kind of just writing a fader, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're boosting it, oh, my vocalist is so quiet right now. And then all of a sudden they just start belting, you know, that's, that, that creates a bit of a challenge for you. So our compressor is going to help to to automatically kind of control those highs and lows. Um, first, so first we want to turn it on. Step one: make sure your compressor is engaged. And on the touch mix here, you'll know that it is engaged because it will kind of illuminate and come to life once you toggle that switch to in. Um, and then we're going to need to find our threshold. So step one is finding the threshold, and the threshold is the point at which the compressor is going to start to compress our signal. Okay, and the way we find this is with two things. We have a visual tool here. This is our gain reduction meter. So once we once we start to adjust this and we will be able to see gain reduction start to happening once we reach the point that it is starting to compress the signal. Uh, we're also going to want to use our ears at the same time. You know, we're talking about audio engineering here. So this is very you know auditory. You want to be listening for the changes that you're applying to your channels. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick example. I do have my mic plugged in here. So I'm going to adjust my threshold as I talk into this and then see where we, there we go. Okay. So you see that right, right when I went just past negative 20 dB, then I'm, it's starting to grab and it's starting to grab, um, just about, uh, every, on every syllable that I'm speaking. And that is more or less what you want. Um, and again, this is more of a subjective tool. So I'm going to give you the broad strokes of it because uh, there are a lot of really creative things you can do with this. So it all depends mm -hmm. on what you're going for. Um, but yeah, so for the most part, for 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 it for you to know that it's doing its job, uh, you can see the gain reduction happening on the meter. And if this channel were live and going anywhere, you you would definitely be able to hear that that compression start to to affect the channel a little bit. And 
what you, for the most part, what you want is for the compression to sound as natural as possible, um, unless you're going for a specific effect in which you want it, you, right. you kind of want that, uh, that unnatural sound or that, that slightly distorted sound that a compressor can give you, uh, if you start to compress it a lot. So at this point, if I keep going with my threshold, you can see now I am getting a very heavy amount of gain reduction at all times. It is constantly under gain reduction. No uh, pressure, Jason, but John is listening. Uh-oh. Oh, no. <laughs> That's all for today, folks. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, we'll, we'll regroup. Um, no, welcome, John. He thanks for, thanks for joining us. Doing good. <laughs> um, yeah, so so basically, you know, if you if you want the compressor to just kind of do its job and not necessarily um, affect the 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 quality of the sound very much, you're looking for for some gain reduction that's just kind of kind of dancing in and out as the vocalist is inflecting into the microphone. And what um, the compressor has to do is keep that vocal in the mix. Yes. You can, by using your ear, adjust the threshold of the compressor so that it's not flying out of the mix. Also, adjusting. Have you the? Did we go into ratio yet? Not yet. That's, that's, that's where I'm going now. So after after threshold, after we find the point at which we're happy with the gain reduction, now we go into the ratio. Okay, and the ratio in a compressor is how much a compression is being applied. And just to make this simple, I'm gonna round this off to two to one. So our ratio here is two to one. I don't know if you can see that, but take my word for it, it's at two to one. Uh, so what that means is that for every decibel, every single decibel, or sorry, every two decibels that the signal goes over our threshold, the compressor is going to compress that to a single decibel. So two to one. So every two decibels gets reduced to one decibel. So it's not a limiter. We're not stopping our signal once it reaches our threshold. We're just rolling it off. We're, we're, we're reducing the, the dynamics at that point. And then, so as you increase your ratio, you're getting a higher level of compression. So at a three to one ratio, um, if you extrapolate that out, so every three dB, you exceed your threshold, that gets reduced to a single dB. So then six dB above will get reduced to two dB. Nine dB would get reduced to three dB. So you can see where, where I'm going with this. So the higher your ratio, the, the, the more intense the compression is and the faster you're going to start to hear your compressor. Um, so just things to keep in mind when you're using this. Um, a, to, to keep it a more natural uh, compression sound, um, usually about 2.5 is where I'd start. It's a starting point, not necessarily gonna, gonna be your catch-all, um, but it's a good place to start. He, listen to what it sounds like, maybe adjust it up or down a little bit from there and see what you get. Play with yeah, your ratio the threshold. Do with the genre that you're mixing for. If you've got a Definitely. belter, if you've got a belter, you're gonna wanna increase that ratio. Yes. If you got a jazz singer, I use a whole lot less, probably about Way three less. Months. Absolutely. Uh, also, if you're dealing with, if you do have a, a lead singer and then maybe a backing vocal section, um, a lot of times it's it's good to add a little bit more ratio on the backing vocals. That way you can actually have them sit a little bit lower in the mix, but they don't get lost because they're being compressed yeah. a little bit heavier than the lead vocalist. Um, so they can kind of play with each other a little nicer. That's another right. Thing. Keep so, them in the mix. Keep them in their place. Yeah. Stay <laughs> in your place, back up. You're in your place. Uh, and then with that, the other thing that to be aware of, you, you, you do have your attack and, and release, and we're not gonna get too deep into that for this topic. Um, we have done um, a topic entirely on compression in the past, and we may do another one where we really kind of dive into this tool uh, by itself. But for this topic, we're kind of gonna focus on your threshold and your ratio, and then your gain reduction, or, or sorry, your, your gain knob, which also is add back gain. Yeah, add gain back. There's another term for it that some, some mixers use. Makeup gain, makeup gain. Makeup gain. Thank you. Um, <laughs> what we're doing when you're seeing your gain reduction here, uh, you'll notice a slight difference as you start getting the compressor working in your input and your output. Meaning the compressor realistically is attenuating your signal as it's compressing the signal. Okay, uh, so. If you want to make up for that, if you want to bring that overall signal back up to its original input level, you've got your makeup gain control in which you can re-add the gain back into the signal. So what you've essentially done is you've used the compressor to squish your dynamic range to something like this. So instead of a huge dynamic range, we compress it so it's something like this. And then we can actually take that with the gain knob in here and then raise the whole thing up. 
So what that does is it gives you the effect of taking the, the lowest, most quiet points in your signal and boosting them and making those louder and more present without mm -hmm. the really loud parts getting out of hand. So exactly. Pretty cool. That's a, that's a, that's a major flyby um, explanation of a compressor, but um, hopefully that gives you the idea. Really quick, Jason, can you tell us what to be careful for with yes. compression? So a couple things to watch out for. Um, if you start to compress things too heavily, particularly on a vocalist, um, you might notice the overall sound can become a little darker. I mean, you can actually start to take away from the intelligibility of that channel if that compressor is, is hitting it too hard or it's, or it's working a little bit over time there. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that can have an adverse effect. Another thing you want to be careful of, particularly if you're using floor monitors, um, uh, if you have too much compression on a vocal channel, you can end up with a, a feedback problem. Um, it's called compressor latch. Um, it's, it's very technical. Um, so if you want to look up a compressor yeah, latch, is, I, compressor go, lets go. Yeah, yeah. At the point the compressor lets go of the vocalist, it's, it's it drives the gain up so hot because it when it's compressing it's compressing so heavily that when when you when you put that mic down or when the singer stops singing or takes a breath uh that compressor letting up on that channel increases the gain so fast so quickly you know that the channel just feeds back and it's it's nuts. so the example would be they're fine during their song and then they go into a talking moment and the monitors are just feeding back that a lot of times has to do with super loud monitors and a lot of compression and the compressor letting go no good. because the button is quieter and the compressor yeah. isn't working as hard and it's- Don't want that. Um, so yeah, so those are some things to, to, be, to be wary of when you're using your compressor. One other thing that I wanna touch on before we, we move on here is the de-esser. This is um, a pretty nice uh, addition. Most well, I say a lot of compressors do um, include a de-esser within it somewhere. Um, there are also standalone de-essers that you can apply depending on your mixer or the software you're, you're using. But a de-esser is um, a compressor that focuses on a specific bandwidth. So it, it's, it's a band compressor that is compressing a specific um, frequency range um, that is traditionally where you find vocal sibilance. So, de-esser is sort of an onomatopoeia. If you think of uh, the S sound you make when you speak, S, a de-esser helps to reduce those sounds of, of a voice. So if, you, if you're having, if you have a particularly, particularly sibilant vocalist or talker, if it's a speech, um, the de-esser can be really, really handy in taming that particular region or, or getting that under control. So you're not getting that high amount of sibilance in the sound system. Um, and it's very simple to use. Make sure that it is turned on. And you're going to, the dial here is going to um, determine the amount of gain reduction that it will apply to that frequency. And touch mix here, it is set to a specific frequency range. And we're just going to tell it how, how aggressive we want to attenuate um, that, that, re that region. And again, um, using your ears as you're applying this, because that, that is your best tool uh, that you could that you, that you yep. have at your disposal. Yep. Okay, so now should we talk about effects? Yeah, adding the sauce. Let's okay, do it. So we've got we've got the channel pretty well tamed with our EQ and our compressor. We're sounding really good. We've got it sitting really nicely in the mix. Let's get add some secret sauce here and sweeten this guy up uh, with some effects. So if I navigate to my effects channel here on the TouchMix 30, I have six uh, effects engines. Um, you could also think them. Think of them as um, six different inserts in which I can recall uh, any of the available effects uh, that are available on TouchMix. Um, for a vocal channel, uh, two almost universally used effects are reverb and delay. Um, and so you can you can dial up either of these. So we've got a mono and a stereo delay, and it's on the TouchMix. It's as simple as you know selecting the slider for that particular effect and dialing it up. Uh, to the amount at which you would like to hear that effect. That's it. So we've got the mono delay. We can apply it. We can bring that up. Or if we want to use some reverb, there are two fantastic reverbs on touch mix. Uh, they're kind of um, kind of hidden jewels in this mixer, if you will, that the reverbs. You've got a lush and a dense reverb. Um, and so we have the ability to very easily dial any of those up as we see fit uh, for a vocal application. Now, there are also... Um, you're not limited to using a single 
effect on a vocal channel. So you don't have to just say, okay, I, this is a vocalist. I'm going to go with a delay on my vocal channel. That's what I want to do. Or, you know, I think I'm just going to put some reverb on it. It's, you certainly can do that. Um, but the ability to blend multiple types of effects together can often lead to some really, really cool and special results. Yeah. Um, so for example, using a delay and a reverb together uh, can give you some, some pretty cool sweetness to that to that freaking to that channel. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so in in that instance, what you might want to do, uh, you know, have during the sound check, have your vocalist be be vamping or or speaking, uh, and you kind of just dial up one at a time. You dial, you get your reverb set up, so it's at the the amount that you like it at. Um, you know, maybe maybe you want it super wet, or maybe you kind of want the reverb to just kind of sitting sitting behind, nestled behind where the vocalist level is. You get that all kind of dialed in. You get that set, and then you choose your second one. And oftentimes what I will do is I'll actually go into the effect itself and mute it. Once I get one set, you mute that one so that you so that you can concentrate on the second one uh, on its own. And we go back and now we, hand, we have our delay. We get that at the point where we want it. So that's sounding pretty good. Maybe we want a little more delay than reverb or maybe a little less. Uh, either way, you kind of just on its own, you get that set to the level you wanted at. And then you go back and you unmute your reverb and you kind of see what that sounds like. And yep. most of the time it's going to sound really good. Uh, sometimes you may need to, to, to adjust one or the other based on the second effect kind of coming in and playing. But really quickly, for the most part, let's talk about a few settings that can help people um, get the effects sitting correctly. Yes. On the delay. What do you have in mind? On the delay to use it with a reverb and have it act somewhat like a reverb. Um, but still have the delay effect is maybe set it to 280 milliseconds. Okay. So it's pretty fast. Pretty fast. And then, going there. yeah, yep, like that. You're going to make sure you roll off a bunch of the low end uh -huh. on that delay and roll off some of the high end as well. Very good tip. You don't yeah, want so that being the forefront sound in your effects. It's, it's, it's um, helping, it's adding, it's adding an effect. It's not the main thing. Right. So I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. So you will notice if you come into the effects themselves, they do have their own <laughs> filters. We've got a high look at filter in the delay. And you'll notice we've got, do we have that in here? We do not have that in the lush reverb. Um, now then that section on the reverb, yeah. I for vocals, I like to use the EQ to roll off the low end in the vocal. Yes. So you do have EQ control. Jason, go ahead and click on that for me. On, yep. I'm on the tab. There we are. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I will for a vocal, I will roll it off, um, depending on it, how much it's interfering with the rest of the mix. Sometimes up to 200. Yeah. And then, in some cases, if you want airiness in your reverb, uh -huh. I will boost. Give a little boost in that high oh. end there. Just add some air to the reverb. It's very yeah. like very common in the house of worship <laughs> um, side of things to have that airy kind of reverb. Very good. Um, uh, I, I don't, I only see two bands there to adjust, but you know, uh, on yeah, the DAW, they, when they, I have two band with, that, a, with a low cut in here. So um, do I, yeah, we do. I'm going to go back. There we go. I like it, you know, when I have the option, I do like to cut some 2K out so it allows the dry part of the vocal to, to stick out, but the other for reverb to dance around the drier part of the vocal. Mm -hmm. um, they, that's called the Abbey Road effect. I think it, it, they started using that effect there at Abbey Road first. But um, another thing that's super important on reverb, if you want to get the reverb away from the vocal, especially on the uh -huh. initial transient, yep. is to use some pre-delay. There you go. Yep. In classical music, I don't use any pre-delay. They just okay. like it swimming all over the place. Yep. But in, Real well. um, in rock music and jazz, I'll have anywhere from 40 to 60 sec milliseconds of pre-delay, and it really helps separate the vocal from the reverb so it's not swimmy. There you go. It's not yeah. Again, it. And what that's going to do by adding that pre-delay, that's just that's just going to bring a lot more of the clarity back to your channel. So you're getting you're getting the nice reverb effect that you want by 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 dialing up a little bit more pre-delay. Um, you're you're cutting out kind of the swampiness that can build up 
when you when you get the reverb going and so, so you, you still get the the overall reverb effect with the nice tail that you like while maintaining the intelligibility so that's where the pre-delay really comes in handily yeah and, and then of really course on this lexicon reverb here you have the option to adjust the size of the room yes. right now the size is set pretty it's high enormous. So the, you'll the biggest room I've ever seen. Yeah. No, it's not. It, and you can make it just be ambient by setting it super low, mm -hmm. or you can make it really have a long decay by setting it super high. So on this particular reverb, that that's how you'll do it, just by adjusting the room. Yeah. The size. So I guess very, very, very cool. Very good kind of whoops ways to manage your effects and hopefully now, a couple of ideas we ask about adding effects to oxes so yes can you run through that really quick jason okay yes we'll get, go through that um and then maybe we should kind of take a look at some of the questions we have here and, and dive into a few of those but yeah. getting effects into so, oxes a uh, very common application um can be a slippery slope however so let's take a look at how we do that. There's a couple of ways on the touch mix specifically that you can start to apply your effects signal into your auxes. Um, just to, real quick, just to set this up, there is, a, there is a difference in how effects are applied in the main mix and how your effects are going to be applied in a, a monitor or in an aux mix. And the biggest difference is understanding these faders. So these are your effects master faders. So think of this, this is the main output level for each of your effect uh, sends, if you, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so when I'm in my channel and I'm adjusting these sliders, so this is sending my single vocal channel to my first two effects in this example. So if I come out here and go into my effects masters, so now my vocal channel is going to be coming into these two effects and I have the ability now to increase or decrease the overall amount of the effects this effect within my mix. Now, this is really going to start to um, to to have have a have a greater effect uh, when we have more than one channel uh, being sent to one or more of these effects. Okay, so now let's say I go into my second input and I add this to the same delay. All right. Now I have both of these channels that are being sent to my effects one, which is my delay. And in the main, that's going to be great, OK? And if I were to adjust this fader up or down, the overall total amount of that effect would be affected within my main mix, meaning now the effect uh, the effect that it has on both inputs one and two are going to be increase or decrease as this fader is moved, OK? So that's step one in understanding how we're going to use this in, in an aux. And the reason you need to understand that be is because when we move into an aux, the only effect controls you have in the aux are your main effect faders. Okay, yeah, so that just is imagine. how you apply the effect to an aux. So now if you have channels, so right now in my example, I've got inputs one and two going to effect one. And one of those channels, input one, is my vocalist. So let's say my vocalist wants to hear her, her his or her effects in their monitor. I can turn effects one up in their monitor mix, and now they're going to hear that uh the 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 effects on their voice however i also have input two going to effects one so whatever channel input two is is also now going to be introduced into the into their monitor mix through the effect channel okay hopefully yeah, that the, you can may not that. like that <laughs> and they may not want that so they might that might be element you don't want. so a, a very common issue that can happen is the vocalist and the snare drum are placed through the same reverb effect because yeah. very often the effect that you use on your vocalist also sounds really sweet on the snare drum. So you just run them both through the same effect and it sounds really cool. And you're only using one effect. Well, now that singer wants to hear the reverb in their monitor. So you pull this fader up in the monitor and all of a sudden they're, they have the reverb, but they also have this really, really washy reverby snare drum in their monitor as well. And most vocalists will not like that. Uh, <laughs> so that, that presents a problem. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, yeah. you know, the way to get around that is, you know, hopefully you, you haven't maxed out all of your effects channels on different things. And so you would end up utilizing two reverbs. You end up, you use a reverb for your vocalist and a second reverb for your snare drum. That way, when you pull up the channel that your vocalist is running through, they're not getting the snare drum, but you still have a snare drum going through their reverb. So in the main mix, everything still sounds sweet. Yeah, you have six 
effects that you can choose. So as right. you're organizing your effects, I would suggest keeping your vocal effects um, relegated to certain channels, your drums coming through only one one effect, like don't share vocals with drums and no. perhaps your instrument effects not sharing with anything else, that'll help alleviate some of that um, monitor effect issue with sharing effects between totally different instruments. Yeah. Very good. Um, cool. Let's take a look at some of these questions. Um, let's see. What about pre and post fader on effects? So that's a good question. I think that might relate to a question that's that came in earlier about sending effects to auxes without going to the main. Um, but so let's address so pre and post on the effects. Let's go to my effect here. Uh, setup. So we have our pickoff point. So we have pre fader and post fader. It is defaulted to post fader, uh, meaning the channel fader for whoops, the channel fader here will affect the level. So as so what, with that set to post, I know I've gone in here and I've, I've, I'm delivering this to a certain level to the effect. Um, this fader, however, will also drive that signal harder or softer. So as I'm increasing or decreasing the actual channel level, that is going to be driving that channel into the effect more or less. Um, so if you don't want that to happen, so if you don't want that the the, the fader itself to be dictating the effect level, which um, for most cases you do want that, um, but I suppose there are a few examples where you might not. Um, you what about yeah. monitors? What's that? What about effects in the monitors? Okay. As far as pre and post. Pre and post. So the this is global. So, so it's for the effect itself. So if you do set this to pre, um, I suppose that would allow for the effect to you. So, so if the, if the main mix fader is not affecting that, that chant, that level going into the effect, um, you could have more of a static effect level once it's introduced into an aux through the, yeah. through the main effect. Um, I'm trying to think. I believe there is a way to get effects into the aux without it going to the mains, but I haven't done it in a long time and I'd have to think it through. These are good questions. Well, though. I'm going to think on that. And you can, well, the, the, the faders for the effects are separated from each other in the main mix and the um, aux mixes. For example, um, sure. I can have okay. them at one point the mains yes. and in my when I'm doing broadcast mix I oftentimes will add more of that uh -huh. effect in my broadcast mix so they are separated from each other very good so you're saying the you can, at which point are they separated could we clarify that in the main mix, you can set your effects to a certain position that's perfect for the house. Yep. And in your broadcast mix, if your effect masters are all the way down, they will be completely dry, right, 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 and right, right, you right. Can set those faders exactly to where you want them. Of course. So that that's uh, the global uh, effect channels here. So that the master effect output channels. Of course, you have. Exactly. Yeah, that's control, what I'm talking about. Control of that level within the in the main mix, and then every mix thereafter. So yeah, so you could. Um, in theory, pull this, you know, have, have channels going to one of your, your effects in the main mix, pull that channel all the way down and then in another mix, pull it up. Now you're hearing that in the, in the mix and not in your main. Yes. So the question is when not to set to pre, don't set to pre. The effect <laughs> should always be in post. What happens if you part, were yeah. to bring the channel down and you were set to pre with your effects, all you would hear is no dry sound from the signal, but an all effect. That's all, what you yeah, would hear. All affected even sound. Even with the fader all the way down. So always have your effects set to post. I mean, unless you want that. Usually I don't, you don't. I don't want that. You know, I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, there might be some application for that. I don't know what it is. Um, but. <laughs> cool. 
Cool. I'll take a couple more questions here and then we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, how do you save all your settings to a USB key? Well, that is really easy. Um, if you if you know how to save your setting, first of all, um, I can go and give you a quick example of that. I can go into my input one. I can go into presets. So if I just want to save a channel preset settings, I can save it. I'll go, I'm going to switch my toggle up here from factory to user. Um, I'll give it a name. I'll say um, Jason Vox. Um, and now you have a save location. Uh, I, if I had a USB connected here, I could switch that to USB and then it would save it onto my USB. If I already have my preset saved on the mixer, I've got it there. And from this screen, if I connect a USB storage device into the mixer, I can also highlight it here and it will give me the option down here, copy to USB. And I can hit that and it'll just copy it right onto the connected USB drive. Super simple. Um, that is for presets. You can also do the same thing for scenes. If I go into my scenes menu, I do have my factory mixer and USB menus here. So if I did have a USB drive connected to the mixer, any of these scenes, or sorry, anything in the mixer, then the custom mixer scenes, I can copy over to the um, to the USB and vice versa. Um, or if I'm saving a new scene, uh, I can save it directly onto a USB if I want to do that. So you do have that option there at the point at which you save those uh, scenes or presets. That's a fine question. OK, we have another one here, Shrill Soprano muddy muffled sounding male vocalist 80s mm -hmm. cover band oh, with two nice. guitars bass and keys how are we going to get vocal clarity for the lead singer male or female fun one do you want to talk that jason or go ahead yeah you got it okay um the range at which the vocals have intelligibility the most intelligibility would be anywhere between two to 4.5 or 5K. So that is what I am giving the vocals. Now, if guitars, if electric guitars are fighting for that space, I would do maybe a cut there for the electric guitars to allow the vocal to shoot through that space. Um, if your mm -hmm. keyboards are if, if you hear the keyboards kind of occupying the space mm -hmm. where vocal intelligibility is, I might do a cut there mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And that allows for the vocals to be able to cut through some of the instruments. It's good to learn the ranges in general with EQ, the ranges of your instruments. So you know where to place yeah. high cuts and low cuts So because you don't want to allow any signal information coming through that doesn't need to be there. Yeah. For example, Absolutely. a violin only goes to um, a, a very certain range. You don't want to have include any frequencies below that in no. there. So you you would roll it off to that point. And that there's charts up there on yeah. uh, online that, that you can download that show similar. the exact frequency ranges and yeah. what their harmonic ranges are, e even beyond the actual notes of the instrument. And that'll help guide you in where to set the roll off mm -hmm. points, high cut, low cut for your instruments in general. Yeah, absolutely. So sim similar to the EQ chart that we showed, you can find other charts that just kind of show the frequency range of particular instruments. Um, and, and that those combined are really, really good to study and just kind of have at your disposal to, to access uh when you're and then again there's nothing wrong with that like print that stuff out have that with you as a reference when you're mixing yeah and i would memorize that kind of stuff because any mixer you step up to you're going to have to apply this now i have to a shootout for the presets on the qsc touch mix yes. if you load i was going to close <laughs> preset an instrument channel preset those are already going to be set in the right place Let's do for this. example um Let's do one. Let's do one that um, you wouldn't consider. Let's do the fiddle, okay. the violin. We, I, I have this happen a lot with some of my eclectic string American eclectic fiddle. grassroots groups that come in with fiddles. Let's say the it has a pickup. Pickup, perfect. Yeah, we'll recall this. Recall it. Now go look at that EQ. Hey yo. 
this for the pickup, where the roll-off points are and what was cut in order to make the pickup on that fiddle sound good. And I get at least 85% of the way there when I drop in this preset on a violin with a pickup. And it, it's just a surprising looking EQ. It's surprising. But yeah. But when you hear it, it works. It, works. it really works. So a lot of these presets in the in the touch mix, I have made mental notes and memorized mm -hmm. what the mm -hmm. cues oh, yeah. look like. So I step up to some other situation. It's awesome. That I it's have it's the like a reverse learning tool. You can you can study them and again, like you say, make notes um, and sort Absolutely. of use them to train yourself on what to be looking for and and what what regions to cut and boost on certain types of instruments. Yeah, and that's another reason I love the touch mix. It's so great for training. I. It just, it's epic. <laughs> <laughs> nice for an epic, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. So I think uh, we got to wrap it up here. But one one final kind of all-encompassing tip that I want to put out there is one of the things that you, you want to do, is, especially if you have the option of mobility while you're mixing. So let's say if you have an iPad connected to the mixer and you can kind of walk the room and, and, and mix from different locations within the venue, um, uh, sort of be uh, moving and be mobile during sound check and while you're dialing all this stuff in because um, as you're affecting something, you'll notice that it'll sound one way when you're standing in one position and then yes. you go somewhere else and it's going to sound totally different. Um, yeah. So having having that in your head while you're making these adjustments and kind of maybe making compromises between what something sounds like in one area versus another, so you can kind of maybe even it out as much as you can. So you're so you're get you're giving the best experience uh, to the audience no matter where they are. Um, that can be that that can be a, make a big difference in in the overall sound and, and the performance. Yeah, I agree. Excellent. Yeah. Before I go, I wanted to let you know about a couple of helpful Facebook groups that we have. Yeah. Um, we have the QSC Touch Mix group. So if you own a Touch Mix or are interested in owning a Touch Mix, or even if you don't own one, but find yourself mixing on one, this is an informative group, Everything Touch Mix. And then the other Facebook group we have hosted by QSC and myself is called Church Sound Training. And this is a group actually created for church sound people and their volunteers, but the audio concepts that are taught here are universal and applicable across all platforms. And because adding to your audio knowledge and understanding helps you to operate your touch mix and all other audio equipment with better yeah. skill and precision. 100%. So, yeah, yeah. Well, this has been an excellent topic, Jason. Great job. Yeah, this Great one. Was, I was looking forward to this one. This is fun. Um, yeah. Looking forward to jumping back online and doing these things again too. So we're gonna we're gonna try to get back to our weekly schedule of these. So we'll we'll be back next week with another topic. Um, and please um, get in touch with us and let us know if there are any specific topics that you would like us to cover. Um, you can get a hold of us through the groups that Golden just mentioned. Um, or there are various ways that you can find on the QC website to get in touch with me versus e via email and things like that. So um, yeah, we, we love hearing from you. Hopefully this was helpful to everyone out there and we'll definitely see you again in about a week. Yeah, awesome. All right. Well, All have right. a great rest of the day, everyone. Absolutely. Have